So, Robert, I have to say, growing up, my grandfather's favorite place to escape to, any time that the family or my grandmother had gotten too much for him, he was always scooping me up. I lived down the street, and we would always go off to Dunkin' Donuts and hide out. And it was for him, it was having his coffee and his bear claw and the paper. And he could sit there for hours. And, and any time there was any of that friction, he was about to, to lose his top. He found, he found Dunkin' Donuts to be a place that he can hide out. What do you think of that, Robert? I, I would say, Johnny, that I have been, wherever I go, people always share with me their favorite Dunkin' Donuts story. It's usually, as a child growing up, they go with a parent and they pick out their favorite donut. I have to say, you stumped me. This is this is a brand new one for me. This is the first <laughs> time I've I've heard of this as a grandparent's escape. So I'm going to have to add it to my repertoire of among my favorite stories. You know, there are five million Dunkin' Donut customers around the world, so each of them has their own unique story. You know, something, and it warms my heart to hear that kind of story in terms of how people use the brand. Yeah, for me, it was going with him. And I, of course, as you mentioned, to be able to pick out my donut or a couple of donuts from that huge rack. What, what young nine year old doesn't want to be in front of that, having that opportunity? So I, it always made me smile anytime he wanted to go over there. No, it's a lifetime memory. And, you, and that warms me. That, that is a great story. And thank you for sharing it. So, Robert, to get this started, the book was so fascinating, learning about your leadership journey, but also the history of Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, that is an iconic brand. I had no idea that it was originally part of a small family food business that grew into an international success. That story starts with you taking over for your father in the middle of an epic battle with your uncle. Can you paint this picture for our audience? of what you were getting yourself into after business school. I was, uh, I'll put it kindly, a cocky 25 <laughs> year old graduate. Uh, I had sort of virtually grown up over the store. My father and my uncle were in business together. They were brother-in-laws and, and, uh, and they ran this industrial feeding business. And that business after the war had grown. My dad was an eighth grade educated uh, kid, but a real uh, talent for business. My uncle was a CPA, a, a much different kind of guy. They were partners and they had this industrial feeding business, which were the trucks that would go around the factories. This was after the Second World War. So we're talking about 1946, 47, and they would feed employees that would come out of off, small office buildings or construction sites. And that business grew rather dramatically. Um, but um, you know, the vending machines came along sort of in the late 1940s and started to put a crimp in that business. And um, they had heard that there was a donut shop down the street that made more money out of one donut shop than it did out of its 20 root trucks that sold donuts wholesale all over the town. So the partners, you know, intuitively decided, well, that may be the answer to keep their business dreams alive in terms of how to, how to make a diversification move out of a business that was now starting to struggle. And they opened up a store in Quincy, Massachusetts on the road to Cape Cod called the open kettle in 1948. And lo and behold, it, it wasn't very successful. <laughs> it was in a little stucco building with no windows and it called the open kettle, but inside they had great coffee and they had you know, featured the 28 varieties of donuts. So there were a series of happenstances and sort of the role that luck and second chances play in life. They also do in business. And the, if things weren't tough enough with opening up a, a donut shop, no more successful than all the other thousand donut shops that were open in Massachusetts in 1940, the guy across the street decided he's going to open one too. So before they knew it, they had hired the architect and the architect came in and said, you know, we're going to have to rip this stucco hot down. We're going to have to reopen this up, put a California style. You guys would like this California style <laughs> outrigger, see-through fishbowl effect as a store. And, you know, open kettle doesn't really say anything. And, you know, what do you do with a, a chicken? You pluck a chicken. What do you do with a donut? You dunk a donut. And that was how the chain got restarted. And what was a, 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 a $1,000 a week uh, open kettle reopened in 1950 as a $5,000 a week uh, Dunkin' Donut shop with donuts selling at 55 cents a dozen and coffee selling for a dime. 
And that was the beginning of an empire. The partners couldn't get along. Uh, my father bought my uncle out. I went off to college uh, and came back and found out that my father had spun out a lot of different businesses. And now his business is called Universal Food System. And what did my uncle do? My uncle took the money and he decided to start a competitive donut chain, not encumbered with all these other businesses. And my uncle was now enjoying the reputation of the guy that really started the donut business to my father's everlasting chagrin, pulling the hair out from his head. He, he didn't like to lose. And uh, long story short, he tried to sell a business, couldn't put a, an executive vice president in who couldn't solve the problem. And uh, he turned to his 25-year-old son and said, you know, take it over and see what you can make out of all of this. This, uh, this hodgepodge of businesses called Universal Food Systems which is what I did. It took a bunch of weeks to think about it and uh, finally decided that the hunch I had while in business school really might, might prove to be right by narrowing the focus, niching down, burnishing up the diamond in the rough out of the eight businesses. One of them was called Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and they had uh, about 100 stores when I got there. Mr. Donut had 80. And the next five years was a battle of our lives to see who was going to emerge as the king of the donut field. The, the donut wars was on. <laughs> <laughs> now, over the years, we've worked with some clients who've faced a similar situation of taking over a family business and the pressures that comes along with that, as well as now as a youngster stepping into that leadership role, obviously with your father running the business and the respect that he garnered with the team. How did you step into that role and what did you do to earn the respect to become that leader? Basically, uh, there were a lot of emergencies, but basically we started to chart a new strategy. What did we want to be? We do going to basically exit and starve for resources. The other little businesses that were there, Pancake House, a, a vending machine company and a cafeteria company, um, uh, hamburger chain, a la McDonald's. We were in lots of different businesses. So we were basically going to focus on that. And the 26 stores that had opened the year before I got there were all food donut shops. They varied in size. They varied in locations. They varied in store design, menus. Some of them had breakfast. Uh, most of them had scrambled eggs and bacon for breakfast and hot dogs and hamburgers for lunch. It, it was really a, 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 um, what I would call a hodgepodge. And so what we did as a team, we worked together to design a strategy of what we wanted to be. We were going to go to market with a standard 20 seat donut, Dunkin' Donut shop, standardized menu, standardized pricing, standardized configuration. And we were going to focus our energies in certain SMSAs. Those are statistical marketing areas. There are about 300 of them were back then. In the United States, we were going to only grow in 20 or so where we could really build distribution and build ad weight and build brand. We thought brand had value. We weren't sure how to measure it. We came to understand that later. But those were the things that we did. We narrowly focused very successfully and we were off and running. And I caught a few early breaks uh, that came my way, um, uh, converting a, a, a food donut shop in South Bend, Indiana, the franchisee wanted one even though we were converting all of them back to straight donut shops we decided to give him back his money and we'll open as a company-owned store and whoever the very fortunate came out of the gate in those days an average donut shop is doing about two thousand dollars a week this came out of the gate at nine thousand a week we're making a hundred thousand dollars a year in profits which was about as much as the overall company was making the year i got there so i started to look pretty good in the eyes of, of, the, of, of the, my teammates and slowly but surely, we started to build some camaraderie. And as a team, we started to work together and we were moving from success to success. In the first five years, we really had a wonderful golden time uh, uh, where things worked out extraordinarily well for us. Now, I'm sure there were disagreements with your dad at times on that transition. And it could be tough when you want to do your best and fulfill your dreams, but they don't always align. Uh, certainly, especially with your father. Did you run into any of those situations? And how did you deal with persuading your dad to go along with this plan? That's a great question. <laughs> the answer to your question is yes, certainly. <laughs> uh, my dad and I had different lives. My dad was an eighth grade educated guy. He had grown up in the depression. He was scarred by the depression. He never had any money. He was uh, insecure about having a little nest egg or you know, in those days, a million dollars was a big nest egg, but he wanted to be a millionaire. And he thought he had earned it by what he had accomplished. So he was trying to continually sell the business. So as it was growing, I kept finding myself in front of <laughs> prospective buyers. And we had, you know, to do some tussling about really what we stood for. 
he left the day-to-day -day business really, really to me and, and to operate the business. So I wouldn't say that we had major policy differences or strategic differences. It was much more of style. And I was trying to fight Mr. Donut on one hand, and make my hat dad happy. And on the other hand, trying to keep the business from being sold. And that was a hard juggling act. And, and to keep that all quiet, because I felt it was hard to feel the team to be competitive every day. One, they knew that the owner of the business really had one eye out the door. So that was really where an awful lot of, of the tension played out. And I had to design a system in my own head as to when do you sell a business? And I was able to convince my dad to hold on. I promised him that we would go public. And because earnings had gone from um, 100,000 in 1963, pre-tax profits to eight or $900,000 by 19, 68, five years later, we were the third company after McDonald's Kentucky Fried Chicken to go public. So my dad uh, still kept the majority of the stock. And that day of February 6th, 1968, a day that I will never forget, <laughs> he pocketed four and a half million dollars and was the millionaire he always wanted to be and still ended up with about 50 or 60% of the company. So, so it, was, uh, it was a very successful first five years. And it was always this notion that McDonald's had gone public successfully, Kentucky Fried Chicken had gone after, and we were about to go third. And I could always hold that carrot out and that promise. And that was enough to keep them in. And that decision to go public, it sounds like your, your dad was on board with based on those two previous successes that you guys had seen. Yeah, that, that, that accomplished his, his goal of, of monetizing his investment and his time. He was still a young man. My dad was only 47 when I was 26. Uh, 25 when I took over. So by that time, it was five years later. So he was 52, maybe. And I was 30. So, Yeah. And, you know, in the book, you, you talk about building out your leadership skills and there's an art and a science to it. And I'd love to start with the art because those are the skills, the soft skills, the tougher ones for, for many of us to learn. And, and they're not classically taught. So how are you able to grow your empathy, creativity, and tap into that aspiration as a young MBA graduate who had this opportunity, but also all of the stress that was going on around the transition of power. First of all, I didn't know the difference. I had never had another job. <laughs> this is really, I mean, I had worked as a kid, as a manager and a store manager and other things, but I'd never worked in a corporate office. Uh, in fact, my my conference table was a long, long, thin table. It was the only meeting room we had. So I could be holding quarter one end of the thing and they could have Duncan Donald University with all the trainees in there. So I didn't know the difference. So for me, it was normal. And, and, uh, and I would love to tell you that I came to the job fully baked at 25. That's not true. <laughs> I was just partially baked. I understood the importance of strategy uh, for a while. Um, and then I messed it up in the next five year era. Uh, but the, the other skills, the, the sort of what we now would call emotional intelligence, skills. Uh, and that book hadn't been written until 1995, many, many years later. But fundamentally, that was a lot of trial and error and learning and kicking some stones and taking full responsibility for growing up and maturing. And that came from failure or didn't damn close to failure. Sometimes, in my view, in my experience, that were better teachers than success. In my case, success of the first five years was the impediment to future success. I shot from the hip, I became intuitive, I thought I knew better, and the fact of the matter is I didn't. Uh, as the company started to grow, it needed processes, it needed it need boards, it needed ways to be able to measure much more solidly in, in terms of how to design a plan going forward, a, a broader diverse group of teammates at all levels, and all of that came slow but sure. And, and I would say the big leap forward for me came at a transformational moment uh, as I said, the first five years was successful, but then after that, I changed the mission from all the focus to niche down business. I changed the strategy to be a diversified franchising company. Big mistake. So uh, we want to get into that be because that is the the ups and downs of life, and 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 any young entrepreneur and business owner has to go through those. And you mentioned you mentioned your arrogance and hubris. Uh, but I had also heard you mention that you had lost your target 
And as for AJ and I of business owners for the last 15 years, we have battled that as well at times and can understand if you're shooting at the wrong thing, uh, your company can go upside down rather quickly. So I would love to hear more about how you guys lost your target. And in fact, you mentioned earlier that you were able to be successful in those five years because of making your brand specifically target oriented. You brought the niche down and you, sh and you were able to nail it. So what had happened when it went public to where you had lost that target? So I remember the business couldn't draw uh, a million and a half dollars in 1963, went public at $20 million in 1968. And within a matter of a year or so, it was the darling of Wall Street. It was, a high, it was akin to the high tech companies of today. So here I am at 30 years old, sitting on a business now worth $150 million, selling at 60 times earnings, beyond intoxicating and seductive. Yeah. And yeah. as a result of that, and we had grown from a small base, not realizing the law of large numbers, the larger the base got, the more you had to earn in order to keep up. So trying to keep at an aiming point of 50% in terms of my objective earnings per share would have clearly within a few years made me larger than the gross national product of the United States. That never occurred to me. I had the wrong target and began to have my desire to keep my stock price up and looking at Wall Street instead of looking at my business, what my capabilities, what the capabilities of the company were. And all the way through my career, there was always this tension between exploitation and experimentation. Experimentation is doing new things like my dad did, and I began to do again in 1968, 69, 70. And, and exploitation, which is taking some of the things that you have within your business and finding new ways of improving it, geographically diversifying, new product diversification. There are lots of things that you can do sometimes with that business that you have within your midst. And there's always, that's the art sort of, of management, that balance between exploitation and experimentation. And when we got it right, generally it was more narrow niched as when it was right, we were very successful. And when we got too far afield, we generally ended up having trouble. And that was always the tension that went on. But it became very clear to me, I couldn't grow it at 50% at, at, at compound. And when we reduced that down to you know, 15% or so, it was much more achievable. We could experiment and still have money left over to do some R&D and still you know, plant some saplings for future growth. And we could more achieve our objectives. But I had to go through that five-year time period, I think, to really get hit upside the head to really understand those lessons. And, and uh, as I said, it was the best learning I, I could have ever gone through. And uh, that's, I found very useful. And obviously that failure and potentially losing your job and, and losing the business that you've built in, in your ownership uh, is immensely leveling, especially at that age. And yet failure is a part of business and a part of growing businesses. And, and now you serve on boards and, and you advise other businesses who also are facing similar failures. So, you know, what have those lessons taught you and how you view failure now? And, and how do you approach guiding these other companies who are facing similar setbacks and failures, especially in this environment that we're in currently? Yeah, well, that's crisis management it was a little bit different. That's at a, at a high level, we could talk about that as well. But, but uh, what I basically try to do is to, is to help CEOs today to focus on the right mission. What do you want to be? The right objectives. What do you want to have? Those couple of measurable things. You can't measure everything. Some businesses try to their detriment and they get into conflict with each other. So you got to identify really the few that make a real difference, at least at the senior level. It may change as you work your way down through the organization. And what four or five levers will you pull? Because you whether you're a United States government, whether you're a community, whether you're a company, whether you're a family, no one has limitless resources of people and money. And you have to earmark those few that are going to create the greatest impact in terms of achieving those objectives, that are going to bridge that gap between scarce resources. So we work on planning to help them do that. And that's where, that's where I coach and, and um, basically encourage people to take risk. Uh, but to do it within the framework of the, the budget that's been planned, setting aside some money for, for future growth, future markets to open, future programs, future plans. Uh, and in, in that case, with a lot of R&D, and if it doesn't work, close it down fast. 
Yeah, but don't don't be afraid of failure. Failure is part of the game. If you if you're not failing, you're not trying, and you can't be you know 100 accurate until you actually get on the playing field and see how it plays. It just it's impossible to do it in consumer and and and, um, and focus group sessions and asking customers and oftentimes they don't know what they like or want until they physically see it and can touch see touch and feel w- what the options are so you really sometimes just have to try it and prototype small enough edge out i'm a big believer in edging out if it looks good go like you know keep watering it and grow it and if it doesn't look good uh, pull back recalculate if you have to try it again and if it doesn't work second or third time pull it and sometimes the first time if it doesn't look like it's got legs pull it admit defeat walk away try not to put too much r d and capitalize it because it becomes horrific to try to you know take a write off the, the larger that number keeps growing the harder it is to pull the plug when it doesn't look right the more you rationalize it'll it's just around the corner it's a little bit more money a little bit more time oh, it all, and once you if you're a public company once you tell everybody about your R and D, you know, then it becomes a topic of conversation. It, then it's another impediment for pulling the plug. So the kind of lessons I walked away with are: try to expense your R and D as best you can, unless it's really major and it's it's life changing. Try to expense it within your budget. Take a little bit less growth rate that year or those years while you're while you're encouraging that. And number two, generally don't go mainstream, blare the horn until you're ready to go prime time. In other words, uh, you know, when you're working on speculative things, they're speculative and, and they remain in-house until it's ready to to disclose. So it doesn't become the topic of conversation because, I mean, in the real world, those are real problems when you tell a lot of people that, that what you're working on. Everyone wants to know and, and before you know it, it's harder and harder to pull the plug when it doesn't work and a lot of stuff doesn't work. Yeah, and I feel like everyone wants their ideas to become successes. And especially if you've had a few successes already, you want that next idea to, to fall in line. And when it doesn't, that that tension it creates and the, the crisis it creates internally, mentally, is often a, a time when we'll lose our willpower, we'll lose our motivation, we'll feel really defeated. So, you know, what have you done to one, dust yourself off in those situations where, you know, your experiments didn't work? And, and what do you now tell when you advise other companies who have that sunk cost fallacy, who were so dead set that this experiment was going to be the winner and you had to cut the cord and, and admit defeat? And basically, persistence is the most <laughs> important. I mean, if you list the qualities that get you through, it really is persistence because life is lumpy and business is lumpy and you are going to <laughs> encounter setbacks. They just come with the territory and call them setbacks. Don't call them failures. They're setbacks. And it's all how you hold it. I mean, you really create yourself in language. So it's how you hold a lot of that. I mean, as human beings, that really is where the power, the power lies in language and, and what your narrative is. So if your narrative is, you know, let me tell you about what happened to me and I, how I investigated into this thing that I thought was a real winner and it didn't work out. You know, if I come at it that way, it's more likely I'm likely to try it again as opposed to, whoa, it's me, nothing's working. Out. <laughs> a lot of it is how you hold it in your own head. If you really realize that going in, that not everything is going to be successful, and you're going to have to persevere and just don't bet the ranch. I mean, if you really, that I mean, in, a, in a young company, in a startup, oftentimes you can't do that. Sometimes you've got to reposition the business. You're trying to find your real footing. You've got to trial and error. You hopefully have enough capital to try two or three times. Like Dunkin' Donuts had to try three times before it got <laughs> launched. It really was a three fuck. It didn't happen rather than it was open kettle. I was Dunkin' and the management changed the concept of scrambled eggs and had to get relaunched again. So, I mean, that's, what real business is like. That's really the real deal. It's that's the way businesses get started and grow and, and form. So it is, it's jerky, it's lumpy. And I, I hope that answers your question. That, that, that It's persistence that really wins the day in the final analysis. And I think it's important to share those stories around the, the false starts. You know, everyone looks at the iconic brand now and, and I didn't even know the backstory and reading the book was so fascinating in that realm. And I think another part of the the story here is, you know, where do you look to who is your support outside of the company in these situations? And I know we talk to a lot of leaders on this show and it can be very lonely at the top as a CEO having to make all of those difficult decisions face the board, face down shareholders. So, you know, did you have an outlet? Did you have your own 
uh, social group and, and people in your life that you could count on in those situations where you were feeling rattled? Unusual. My closest friends were my teammates. And, I, and, and it was a complimentary set of people. Uh, I did lose one uh, when, when I picked the wrong strategy in the second era. Guy I had driven every day to business school with who, who was a very smart guy that I recruited out of Goldman a, a, after business school. And, uh, and he basically lost confidence in me and left wisely. It was the right thing for him to do if he lost confidence. Uh, but for the most part, my, my, my best supporters were my own teammates. And I felt, I felt in, empowered by them. It was all, I felt so much confidence in them. I didn't feel there was any problem that we couldn't get through together. And uh, that was a huge part of the success of the business. It really was a team story, a bunch of people together for 20 years that respected each other, that complimented each other, that liked each other, no backbiting. It was, it was a wonder to go to work in the morning, irrespective of the, of the challenges and the dilemmas that we faced. Uh, and that's how we got through most of the problems. And I was comforted by their strength and by their talent. It was a talented group of people, very lucky to have great people. My COO guy by the name of Tom Schwartz, I was a year behind me in business school, went to Goldman, got him through the CFO who I recruited, my classmate, and he and I were business partners and complimented each other tremendously. And you know, I never I never felt in it alone. I never felt the loneliness that you talk about. I, I, it was just not a part of what my life experience was working in business. I, I love what I did. I love the people I did it with. I felt comforted by them. Uh, there wasn't anything we couldn't discuss together. Uh, we, we really were very a, a truthful bunch of people that understood the importance of trust and we trusted each other. We came from different backgrounds, many of us, different educational levels, um, but we worked together for a long period of time and, and we won. We had a lot of wins and that keeps us together. That's a, yeah. that's a hell of an elixir is winning. And you know, other than the second five year period, the next four periods after that, after we had learned our lesson, were pretty much wins. You know, we kept growing at 15% a year for the next 20 years. And uh, that's powerful. And, and, uh, and, and so that we could, our stock options allowed us to punch way above our weight in terms of attracting, retaining great people. But that's, 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 where, I, that's where I got my comfort. That's, that's how I looked upon my job. I, I love my job and I love the people I worked with. Robert, you were discussing a lot of the, the R&D and some the projects that were getting developed behind the curtains before you had announced them publicly and, and all the work that goes in that. And you mentioned at the beginning, after that first five years, there was, there was a few misses. However, I had recently just had a, a Dunkin' Donuts put in the retail space of the building I lived in in Los Angeles. Now, Dunkin' Donuts has certainly came a long way from all those years back that I used to go with my grandfather. So when you're doing R and D now and you're riding some of the waves culturally, uh, what, how are you looking at it differently now in research and development comparatively to back then when the misses seem to be much more frequent or do I have it wrong that there's just as many misses that you're dealing with now as well, you always have been, we just don't notice them that much. I'm not as I'm not privy to the misses now. I suspect they are. I think when you have a highly <laughs> adaptive culture, you know, you basically are trying lots of things, and and they're not all going to hit, and you pull the plug when those that don't. In fact, uh, my suspicion is that you're going to find that the that that kiosk that's in your building now will, will might well be closed down within a short period of time. Duncan just announced they're closing down eight thousand locations. The things that I had opened up in the 80s, which were basically taking the product beyond the four walls of the store to wherever people workshop, travel, or play, which was a huge uh, leap forward, which, by the way, was uh, uh, devolved to me by virtue of the franchise owner's wives that owned the franchise in the Philippines uh, on a trip to the Philippines where I went to close them down. It's a longer story, but... But, but basically, Duncan is closing down a lot of locations, 800, I'm sorry, I didn't mean 8,000, 800 locations, because they can't express the full line of their beverage offerings and the full mm-hmm. hand that they want to, to merchandise now in some of these smaller kiosks. So what was appropriate 30 years ago, 40 years ago now, 1980s, 30, 30 some odd years, 
um, know, 40 years ago, is no longer as appropriate today. So they're, they're constantly changing, constantly adapting. And in my judgment, from what I see, you know, I, 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 they changed the name of the business from Dunkin' Donuts to Dunkin', which I totally agreed with it. And, and we had talked about it decades before. So they're constantly evolving uh, the business. And so in, in ways, it's, it's not unlike what we did. It's just different solutions because the technology is changing, the competition is changing, the, co the consumer is changing. And if you don't keep coming up with new strategies every five years, that's why my book is broken down into six eras. Some of them as short as three years, some of them as long as nine, but it really responds to the morphing conditions among the consumer, the competition and technology that require a new strategy or a new look at where you're gonna emphasize, what things you're gonna emphasize and pull and change. Well, there was something I just wanted to bring up uh, in the 80s, which was the, the incredible marketing that still sticks into my brain today with the, the guy who is going to make the donuts, which is became a slogan. It became, it was, you could even say it was a meme before there was memes all the way back then in the 80s. And that was incredibly successful marketing. And we all use those things. We still use those sayings today. Exactly. Yeah, it's absolutely true. However, in 1992, we did a positioning study and we decided that we were no longer going to be bakery led. We were going to be beverage led. We were a beverage business because we had changed the, business, the nature of the way the business was. And we had to retire Fred the Baker, who was the lovable character, Michael <laughs> Vail. Mm -hmm. He had won us three Cleos in 17 year campaign. It was a 17 year campaign. Wow. But to wow. be replaced by an equally phenomenal campaign today, America Runs on Duncan, which is a spectacular campaign, just as effective, but it reflects a change in strategy in the business. And it was Larry Bird, we had gone, we had hired a car, we drove Michael Vail through Boston, everybody cheered him as retirement, we did commercials, where Larry Bird was coaching him that year, because Larry Bird was retiring that year on how to retire and found satisfaction in retirement. And it, but but it, it was a, a, a change, and it was a wrenching one, it was, didn't come easy. You can well imagine, after so much success, we had to, yeah. we had to change, we had to change direction because the consumer was changing, the nature of our business was changing, and we became more of a much more of a beverage business. So today, the Dunkin' Donuts brand is probably, uh, I would say, 60% beverages at least, where years ago when I first started, it was probably 40% beverages. It had done a flip. Well, your last two answers really speak to your ability to find and attract talent and then create a culture that supported you. And in your answer of, you know, feeling supported in the team, I'd love to unpack that a little bit more around hiring, because I know whether you own a business and you have to hire people or you're an employee and you want to be hired, there are certain signals that obviously need to be sent for you to identify this talent. So, you know, what was your thought process, especially in the early years going in and attracting all of these amazing teammates who supported you through all of those eras? And, you know, what are those lessons that you pass on now when you advise other companies around hiring talent? I, I, I'm a little bit more measured and, and thought through what it was. Back then, it was basically, you know, gut feel, as, as most things in my early years were. I was really shooting from the hip. And I was trying to select people I knew from business school that I knew were winners, that were smart, that were able, you know, that, that liked to win. And, and so that I, you know, tried to surround myself with, with a lot of people uh, like that. Uh, and, and there were people already in the business. There were people that started as donut men that turned out to be great operators. And it, their, their talent just shone through, you know, and those were keepers irrespective of, you know, where they went to school or what they did. So that was how it did. But then I would, I would, the advice I would give today, in addition to ensuring that you always have when you can afford it, a great HR person. One of the most critical elements in terms of building a business is someone who really knows people, understands, and has a great feel into the organization, you know, to, to what's going on. But the three things I would advise is, is number one, when you're hiring, is define the assignment very carefully. The more clearly you decide, define the assignment, the much more likely you are to pick the right person. So that would be the first thing I would suggest. The second thing I would suggest is do not try to find someone who's good at all things, is, is that basically 
it's very hard to remediate a person's weaknesses. It's far easier to build on their strengths. And when you view it as a team, it's a team of complementary skills, points of view. You know, you don't expect uh, the CFO to have the same kind of orientation as the market, head of marketing. They're going to have different orientations <laughs> in life. And, and you've got to understand that. And that's part of sort of the orchestration of the team. Pick for complementarity and, and the nature of the assignment. And the third thing would be to match the culture. In our case, our culture was teamed. I was more comfortable in a collaborative collegial environment. I wasn't a guy on a white horse. I'm not an authoritarian by nature that just, I wasn't comfortable that way. I, I like to share responsibility and share you know, the rewards and, and, the, and, the, and the acknowledgements. Uh, we were winners. We loved to win. We were competitive as hell. We were trustworthy. We could trust each other. Everybody's word with their bond and you know, always knew they were gonna deliver. So, I mean, I tried to match culture, complementarity, and define the assignment. And I, I would hope that those three kind of uh, approaches would work. But I also was well served by Rick Power, who was my HR guy for years, and later Deborah Rainier at, at Baskin. Uh, terrific HR people who understood that the tempo of the organization had feels for it. I didn't have to do a lot of usage and attitude studies and uh, attitude uh, uh, surveys within the organization, although we did do them. But generally speaking, the HR person was was a huge help to me. And you and mentioned- I always advise any CEO where I'm on the board, when a company gets to a certain size, that'd be one of the first things I would highly recommend. Strong HR person. It's a key role. And you, you mentioned taking responsibility and sharing responsibility when there are wins. And when it comes to the failures and the setbacks, that's often the hardest for young leaders to take that responsibility. It's easier to point the finger and blame outside external factors or team members or, you know, throw people under the bus even worse. Um, you know, in those moments where you had to step up and take responsibility on the misses, how did you go into those meetings and how did you prepare yourself to take on that responsibility and, and manage the team in a way that allowed them to follow along and, and build that supportive environment? I don't know where it came, I, I, it, 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 but, but basically there was shame associated with failing back in the 70s. I felt terrible, uh, but you have to sort of gulp it down. When things go wrong, if you're the top person, you take the blame, you take the responsibility. There's just no other way around it. It's your responsibility. You made the judgment, you made the allocation. That comes with a job. If you don't want that job and if you don't want that pain, don't take the job because you're not, you're not gonna be able to avoid it. And, and, um, and ultimately, um, it just became a way of life. It seemed to me to work better. When things don't work out, you take the pain. And when things do work out, you share the, the rewards and, and the acknowledgements. That's just the way it works. And in my experience, it works out best that way. And that's what you get paid for, or, or that's what your job is. Forget what you get paid for, but that's what your job is. And, and um, you know, we're living it in public life today where that does, isn't the case. And uh, you can see the kind of pain that that creates and the ripple that it creates in a whole society when it doesn't happen. And, uh, and I believe strongly in that. that, that, that that's a, a real key element of leadership. And we completely agree. And it's an important part that we've tried our best over the last 15 years to bring to our leadership as well, that you can't ask team members to put in all the work and the sacrifice if you're unwilling to take responsibility when things don't go the way you want them to. I totally agree. And obviously, exiting and now seeing it live on, you know, what has been sort of life after this? for you and, and what were you most looking forward to in, in letting go of the reins? It, it, it was hard to, to let go of the reins. It, it, but by that time we had to sell the company to a large English company. I worked for nine years for an English company. Uh, I had gone through four different bosses during that period of time. And my focus became more managing up than it did becoming managing around. Uh, so it, it was time to, to move on after 35 years. And basically, I used the same planning technique that we used in business to do in my own personal life. In other words, what did I want to be? And in my case, I wanted it to be generative. 
So I decided that the next stage of my life and career would be to teach, which I did in the graduate school at Babson, where my son had gotten his MBA. And, and uh, I had started off as, a, as, a, as an advisor on the graduate school thing, and they ultimately invited me to be a trustee. And then I, I, I wanted to teach. So I, I decided to teach, and I decided to also try to help other CEOs in, in public and non-public companies. So that was my second career. And that, that basically came out of the same planning process of what did I want to be? What did I want to have? What four or five key levers was I going to pull with scarce resources? So I started well in advance of the time I knew I was going to leave to start to build that. And, um, and I was given the opportunity by the English company that wanted me to stay on longer than I really should have. In my view, when you're going to transition, probably six months is, is an ideal time. I think I was there for two or three years, way beyond what I should have been after the mantle was passed to satisfy them. And, and then I traded that to allow me to go on other boards while I was working for them. And they allowed me to do that and to begin to teach while I was doing that. So I began to transition well in advance. And now, um, now that that part of my career is over, I'm beginning to look at the next act. If I still have gas in the tank, what, what will be next? And I'm using the same process. The same exact thing. What can I do? What's unique? What can be generative? What would satisfy me personally? What can I add to society? How would I measure my life? And um, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm in the midst of that right now, actually. Well, I know a lot of members of our audience are are asking themselves those same questions, having completed school and, and looking to make that next leap in their career. And that that purpose and, and who do I want to become is, is such a daunting question to ask, ask yourself, especially early in your career. We love having a challenge for our audience members every week so that they can put what they're learning from the podcast into practice. So could you maybe expand a little bit on what that process is for you and, and how you advise others who are looking to start that process of figuring out those deeper answers? I'm in a different, I'm in a different place now. So, uh, you know, I'm at a different age and, and uh, I've been fortunate financially that doesn't have to play in terms of what do I want to have. So basically my purpose in life is, as I see it, is to try to add as much value to other people's lives as I humanly possibly can, whether it's by writing a book or what my next you know, act may be, which may be developing complementary franchisable businesses and, and once vibrant inner city markets with complementary franchise businesses, which is an idea I had in 1968, which I think should be dusted off and maybe tried again in, in my next act. Uh, something I could give my time to. So basically, that that is my purpose. I, when I was younger, I had to worry about what did I want to have, and those were financial objectives, and they had to be realistic and 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 achievable, and uh, that was important to me as well. Um, they weren't the primary motivator in my life. You know, originally, all I really wanted to do is beat Mister Donut, make my dad <laughs> happy, you know, and and keep the business as a family business. I, I had very simple goals. They got more complicated <laughs> as I as I started to grow up, um, and now again they're different now today than they were then. So I, I find that chunking out things in eras is useful uh, because they do change, and what applies in one era might not necessarily apply in another. So for me, I'm in the third era of my life now, and uh, and I, I I find that the tools that I use to plan business. It is as equally useful, and I'm repeating myself, is equally useful in planning a life. And that chunking out and defining those eras, at least the the markers and markings of, hey, this is the beginning of a new era. Is that an internal process for you? Is there something you're looking for to to help you denote the eras to move on and set and chart this new course? They sort of run their course. You know, basically, you know, when I'm finished with a book publishing tour, there isn't a lot more to do then. So I'm going to have a lot of time. I, I can spend it fit doing physical activity, keep myself fit, which is an important element. That's one of the things that I have to do. Traveling with, uh, we travel with one grandchild at a time to different places around the world, which is another activity. I'm very much involved in my grandchildren's lives. And, and the third thing would be, what am I going to do that's generative, that's satisfying, that would bring me peace, fulfillment, and satisfaction, which are the things that I measure as the end goals of life for me. Uh, at an earlier age, it would be maybe those things, but as much it would be about financial returns, which luckily I don't have to worry about right now. Yeah. 
<laughs> and we love ending every interview with a, a ask of our guest as to what they believe their X factor is. What is their unique, extraordinary skill set or mindset that afforded them the success that they've been able to reach? How would you define your X factor? It was my teammates. Uh, they, they were, uh, to a large extent, responsible for the success of what we had in business. And I find that to be true throughout my life. It's really been around the people that have helped me, that have worked with me, uh, that I find you know, a, a way forward. So even in this book tour, it's with the publicist, it's with the publisher, it was with the editors. It's, it's, it's a team of people that I like, that I enjoy, that I like to collaborate with. And that's been a way forward. I don't think I had any particular unique skills in my own view. It happened that I had a wonderful opportunity. My father picked a great industry to start, driven by women joining the workforce, which was the wind in our sails for, for decades. Uh, so I was in embryonic business. There wasn't an awful lot of people coming out of business school that were going into the restaurant industry in 1960. They were going to work for, <laughs> for, for, a, for a banking firm or for a consulting firm. There weren't very many people going to the restaurant business and the restaurant industry. And, and the kind of skills that I had were fit for the job and the time, the collegiality that I liked, the collaborativeness, the things that I liked fit the kind of responsibilities I had a, as a leader. So, I, you know, some of it is just luck. And in my case, the pieces fit together well. And, and um, you know, luckily, I hopefully <laughs> kept learning every time I bumped into a wall, I didn't fall down. So I fell down, but I got myself up and I dusted myself <laughs> off and I learned something from it and kept going. And uh, so would, the two of them would be team and persistence. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing these incredible lessons with our audience. And it was magical to read the backstory of, of Duncan and the experience that I grew up on and, and everything else that went into building that empire. And we really appreciate you joining us. You're more than welcome. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed the time spent with both of you.